109 and 110. Yeah. Fill it out as much as you want. Yesterday's video obviously goes along with uh, 109, but 110 will take care of you on this. And then there's a one que a, qu a question similar to one of these questions um, on a quiz tomorrow. Okay. Uh, this one talks about soda companies often perform taste tests on new products to see if they should release a new product. A new flavor is being tested. The company determines that if the average score on a scale from 1 to 10 is higher than 8.5, um, then they will release a new product as a test in the certain cities. 20 people are hired as taste testers, assume the average score is 8.78 with a standard deviation of 1.1. Okay, so remember on that one on page 110, I asked you to change the standard deviation. So they're saying they want us to have an average score of 8.5. Okay. Uh, they tell us, or I, I had to, I, it wasn't printed in yours for some reason, but make the standard deviation 1.1. Okay. And then they basically want us to say, hey, we, we did a test of 20 people. Um, and they had an average score of the test of 8.78. And is there any other information we need? No. Okay. So, um, so soda score out of 10. Okay. And so we're going to call this. We'll call this X. So is our is our hypothesis equal to 8.5 or is our null hypothesis greater than 8.5? So those are our two first characteristics that we have to do. So notice I'm writing I'm writing the the null and the alternative basically as a smaller unit. You don't have to write out, you don't have to like have a sentence like, hey, this, you know, soda scores are greater than, or equal to 8.5, soda scores are greater than 8.5. You don't have to do that. Just make it simple. You know, do your hypothesis just as H non H H A, and that should help you out pretty nicely on that, okay? Um, because this was given to you as part of the problem, but then we're dealing with a sample. We have to find a standard error. So a standard error is going to take place on this. The standard error is going to be a standard deviation of the original over the square root of our community. Uh, so in this case, we're going to go 1.1 divided by the square root of n, which is 20. Um, which is going to give me 0 0.25. Uh, it said they sampled 20 people, right? Is that on their thing? It said 20 people are hired as taste testers. Second paragraph. Is that right? Okay. I, yours might not have had it because it didn't have standard deviation. I don't know why we didn't have standard deviation on that one. So, but we made it work. All right, so you, the standard error is now going to go in place of the standard deviation. So now you would have enough information to make a normal curve. And on the quiz tomorrow, I will have a normal curve drawn in for you. And I want you to make sure you label it. You know, this is where your mean would be, your original mean. And then you add 1.1 or 0.25, excuse me, so 8.75. Uh, 9, 9.25, and then going the opposite way, that's 8.25, or 8.25, sorry. <clears throat> Let's see, that's going to be 8, and then 7.75. So I will be looking to make sure you have that. Does everyone understand how to generate those numbers and where they came from? Okay, and then they say, hey, we did this, 
we came up with this 8.78. So 8.78 is like here. So we're going to the right. The reason I'm going to the right is because we want greater than. If it was less than, we would go to the left. Okay. So I'll be looking for that, this kind of shading as well on the test or the quiz tomorrow. Okay. And again, 109, 110, you can use it. If you missed yesterday, watch the video for 109 to have it filled out so you know what to go with. Okay. At this point, we are ready to find a p-value. Okay. And again, a p-value is basically when we do a normal distribution. So we have to use Desmos on it. And so I'll jump in and use Desmos. Where's the rest of us? There's some some big party that we should know about that we should go and teach math at. All right, so I'm going to go normal distribution. Um, I have a mean of 8.5, and I have a standard error of 0.25. Okay, if you hit the plus button, that'll give you it. And then we want area to the right, so I'm going to change my bottom bound from negative infinity to the 8.78. Okay, so right there, we have a 13.1% probability that if we were to redo this test, that it's going to work the same way. Okay, so we have 0.13, or let's keep it as 0.13 and call it good. So we have a p-value of 0.13. All right, so is this... Did it give us an alpha score or a different um, score in there? So what do we have to resort back to if there's no score given? P, if P is, in this case, we have P is greater than 0.05. Okay, that's our go-to. If nothing's listed, if there's an alpha value or a different P value, use the alpha as the same thing as the P value. Okay, if that's listed, it won't be on tomorrow. Um, so we have this. So is 0.13 greater than 0.05? Yeah, 13% is bigger than 5%, right? Okay, so we are going to fail to reject the null. Okay, and is there anything about this problem that seems to be a red flag? Anything about this that concerns you? How much? Yeah, only 20 people. So only 20. Okay, so that would mean that we... You know, we should have done this as a T distribution, which still it's going to be the same idea, but still when you have that low of a figure, you, I mean, if you're Coca-Cola and you only do a sample of 20 people to say, I want to release a new market or a new soda flavor, you have a lot more money to, uh, to uh, you know, offer than the, than the $20. I tell you, I did a survey yesterday. Um, you know, it was sent to me in the mail. I opened it up, and it said, "If you do this survey, we will email you a twenty-dollar um, Amazon gift card." So it enticed me. I'm like, "Okay, you're gonna give me twenty bucks to do a survey?" There's only five questions. It had to do with my electric car. I was like, I'll, "I just got twenty bucks from Amazon. It took five minutes of my time to do." So, I mean, they kind of enticed me. So should there be a red flag on that? Well, being that you're offering money for somebody to do it, that should do it. Um, but um, I have a question, though. Is there, or, 
this if this could be a uh, this could be a type what error which type of error type 1 or type 2 if we fail to reject it is a I just have to go back and look at it I'm broken so when we fail to reject the null that's really true is called a type 1 error that's when I fail to reject meaning I have evidence for the hypothesis so fail to reject this when H not is false. Okay, what would a ramification of this situation be? Well, one, you're only testing 20 people, so I would say it could lead to a type 1 error pretty easily because your amount of people. Um, other things that didn't sit on this that would also be a red flag. What do we know about these 20 T people? What does it say these 20 people were what? They were hired. Is that a red flag? Was it a random sample? No. You put out a thing saying, hey, we'd like to hire you to do this. You're not targeting a random sample. Okay, so you don't have a random sample here. So this this has all kinds of, of bad news all over it. You hired 20 people to do this. It was not a random sample of 20 people. Uh, your 20 people is far le is less than the 30, so a normal distribution is kind of a bad thing. So if this company chose to stick with this data, they might make a soda they might make a, a different, a new flavor. That fails. Okay, is it going to cost them money to create a new tasting soda, make the soda, can and bottle the soda? Distribute the soda, hope it sells. This could be this could this has bad news written all over it. Now I have one other question. So this doesn't really pertain to that, but I definitely put this. Type one or type two error. Type two error is when you reject. The null when it is really true. Okay, so type this would be if you had a p value you wanted to be less than 0.05, if you found on Desmos. that P is actually less than 0.05, this is where you would reject the null. When it's true. Okay. So my friends, that should help you with tomorrow. Okay, does everybody have everything that you would need or do you know where to find everything you would need for page 109 and 110 that you should use on the quiz tomorrow? Do you have that? You're good. You feel solid. Okay. Hey, I wanted to teach um, page 39. It's on the two-tail. And don't worry, this is not going to take away from the knowledge you have on, on one-tail. So a two-tail test. So a two-tail test, just so you know, you would have your mean, 
and then you'd have your observed And you have your observed over here. So basically, that would be you have this shaded region here, and then you'd have this shaded region here. Okay, so two tail. So that could take place. That's where you would say if you had a hypothesis that x is uh, equal to some number. And your alternative would have to be x is not equal to the number. Okay? So it could go either way. That's where you're going to change your test. So it says consider the following scenario. Researchers want to know if sugar consumption has an effect, good or bad, upon migraine headaches. Okay? Medical researchers in this case, don't have a preconceived notion about whether sugar might increase or decrease migraine headaches, so they need to construct a test that is open in either direction. Okay, they don't want to tell people to ingest more sugar because they're not, they're not sure if that has an effect on migraine headaches or not. Okay, our sample statistic will show evidence in one direction. It will either be above the mean and on the right side of the bell curve or below the mean on the left side of the bell curve, if we were a one-tailed test, we would shade away from the mean in order to represent our p-value. Remember that the proper interpretation of a p-value is the probability of obtaining a result at least as unlikely as the one we obtained by random chance. With two-tailed alternative hypothesis, this probability extends both directions. One being a perfect mirror image of the other. The p-value is doubled in a two-tailed test because we must include the portion of the bell curve that is further away from our statistic in both directions. So let's assume, let's assume that we have 80 migraine people. Okay? And it's known that this group has an average migraine pain. So their pain threshold for these migraines is 7.2 out of 10. With a standard deviation of 1.1. Okay, so this is, so that means our mean is 7.2. Okay, researchers want to know what the average pain level will be if each participant consumes more sugar than usual for an extended period of time. Okay, so our null hypothesis is based on pain. So our null is, and we'll just call pain x, x is equal to 7.2. Our alternative will be x is not equal to 7.2. Do you see how that does not formulate a direction? We don't have less than or greater than. Okay. All right. All right, and we have 80 people. So we have a standard deviation given, so we could turn our standard deviation into our standard error. And what we're basically going to do here is we're going to take our standard deviation of 1.1 and divide it by the square root of 80 people. Now, first off, friends, is this, is this any red flags on this situation so far? Do you see a term that needs to be seen? 80 people enough? It's above 30. Were these people randomly selected? Specific subgroup. So it doesn't say, does not say anything about uh, random. Nope. So should be should be a flag doesn't mean you shouldn't read it doesn't mean you shouldn't maybe say there might be something here it just means that hey i'm not seeing this so i might or might not feel it's appropriate so we're going to say that this should be 
I'm going to add 1.1, so that's going to give me 8.3. That's going to give me 9.4. That's going to give me 10.5. Go the other way, that's going to give me 6.1, 5.0, and what's 5 minus 1.1? 3.9. Okay. So they're basically stating that they observed the 7.2. So we how do I want to do this? I want to do it this way. So we have our mean here. That's what we're trying to test if it happens, but this is a two-tail situation. So I have this region here. And I also have this region here. Okay? The green and the blue regions are, that's where it's not equal to. Okay? Let's see. Oh, the paper's in front of me. All right, create a null sample and distribution. Let's assume that our sample showed a pain level. So now, now we're going to say, hey, we have this sample. Once we have done this, once that we once we have had the people take the sugar and they got migraines again, our sample then showed a new mean of 7.8. So you think about where 7.8 is. 7.8 is over here. Okay, so that's definitely in the greater than category. But we're doing a two-tail situation. I'm on page 39. Okay. So show the shaded region for the two-tail and calculate the p-value. All right. So p-value is going to be this. Got to do two-tail. All right. So what did we say? We said it was... 7.2, and my standard error was what? I forget. 0.12. Oh my goodness. Anyone see the error I made? These are wrong. I added the standard deviation, not the standard error. Stir up failed, you guys. So sorry. So 7.2 plus 0.12. So this one's 7.3. 2 plus 0.12. 7.44 plus 0.12. 7.56. All right, so this is actually way, way over here. And then if I go the opposite way, 7.2 minus 0.12, 7.08 minus 0.12, 6.96 minus 0.12, 6.84. All right, now I did it better. All right. Yikes. All right, so my standard error is going to be the 0 0.12. 0.12. Draw our normal distribution. Okay, that's what we have. And then we said that we had a 7.8. So 2.8 times 10 to the negative 7, which is 0 0.00000003. So this is going to show us our p-value. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 3. But this is a two-tailed test. I have to multiply this by 2, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 
five, six. Okay, so this is my actual p-value. The reason I had to double it is we did it as a two-tailed test. The likelihood of the way far to the right and the way far to the left is equally probable. So we have to double it. The areas are the same. So is my... We don't have a p-value anywhere there. So normally our p-value is greater than or excuse me, less than 0.05. Okay. So because it's a two-tailed test, I would say double this. So P is less than 0.05 times 2 is 0.1. Okay. So I have a p-value of 0.1 is 0 0.000006 less than 0.1 yep so this would be we would reject our null hypothesis okay this would then lead us to a type 1 error meaning we rejected the null when it's true Okay, so that's basically that problem done in a nutshell. On the back side, it says essentially a two-tailed test requires you to provide two different shaded regions, which one is the mirror image of the other across the line of symmetry, line of the bell curve. This will double the p-value. A question might arise at this point. Is it okay to wait to look at the sample statistic calculated to decide which direction the evidence supports? and uses whatever one-tailed test is appropriate. Okay, this is a big no-no. Unfortunately, it happens. Okay, so this is one of those things where if you were truly doing a major study, you got to make sure that they're being honest about it and they didn't change to validate what they were trying to look for. Okay, so you're, you're not allowed to work backwards. You can't reverse engineer your data in order to get make your hypothesis fall what you want it to say. Um, so it, it's just bad. So for this reason, two-tailed tests, hypothesis tests, are fairly rare. The conclusions we draw are fairly weak, and we'll only be able to find strong evidence for some difference or change that is unspecified. Okay, so, so just note that you probably won't see a two-tailed test too often in doing any type of research, but it should be helpful for you. So I think, I think what we're gonna do, so today's Thursday, right? So I'm gonna say tomorrow, we have the quiz in which page 109 and 110 should be your best bet to do that. I would say this will be due on Monday. Um, page 111, 112. Deal? Everyone happy?